Um, in terms of why we need uh, a transplant uh, is mainly to try and replace uh, the diseased bone marrow and uh, renew the bone marrow from um, a fresh stem cells that we get either from the patient themselves or from somebody else related or unrelated uh, out in the community uh, that can help uh, do this bone marrow transplant. So this is a procedure mainly to try and replace the disease uh, that is affecting that patient and hopefully provide a better life, a new chance to be able to beat that underlying cancer that they are suffering from. Uh, so it's primarily designed for patients who, who are really uh, have a very uh, difficult uh, type of uh, blood cancers who are not otherwise treatable and central transplant provides a potential cure for those conditions. The procedure of stem cell transplant is very much um, depending on uh, what type of transplants we're doing. If there are two types of these transplants, mainly one is autologous transplants, which are requiring stem cells from the same person, same patient collected beforehand, and then admitting these patients for getting through a certain amount of chemotherapy to try and kill that diseased bone marrow, to try and get everything clear from that bone marrow for us to then give those stem cells back in then again. This is called another way of calling this is a stem cell rescue treatment in which we are rescuing that patient from very strong chemotherapy by virtue of giving stem cells back to them. And that allows the bone marrow to grow back again and then hopefully have no disease come back in that time frame. And that is quite a useful way of treating certain lymphoma, multiple myeloma-like conditions. Uh, and a similar sort of procedure is also practiced in certain autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis that allows us to reset their immune system uh, and then uh, bring their disease in control. Similarly, for other type of cancers where sometimes you need bone marrow stem cells from another person, mainly for the fact that the host or the patient who has this disease has a dysfunctional immune system, which means their immune cells are not able to fight back on that cancer. So sometimes we have to replace that immune system from somebody else's stem cells. And this is where we start looking for donors from either related in the family or someone outside in the community, be it in the country or internationally. And those donors then donate their stem cells, which are then given to these patients after a period of chemotherapy, which is again given to replace the disease bone marrow, replace the disease immune system, and then bring in fresh cells to make the new bone marrow and the new immune system, which will hopefully provide that protection they need from any previous disease that may want to still escape. Uh, and this is a very successful way of immunomodulating, in other words, changing how your immune system behaves and improves your chances of being cured from that disease. And this is what actually happens in that uh, stem cell transplant procedure. It's like a drip of stem cells going through a peripheral blood um, in your drip arm uh, after a period of chemotherapy, and you have to stay in uh, for a few weeks in the hospital to recover from that treatment. Uh, the chemotherapy itself is quite toxic and can give you a lot of side effects. Uh, however, with stem cells going back in, it allows the, the bone marrow to recover quickly and have a successful recovery in a few weeks after. But the process continues in terms of managing that in, in, and avoiding any significant complications after that transplant is done because things can still go wrong later on, even after you have recovered from that procedure. So There's a very much of a um, close relationship we have with these patients. We see them on a regular basis and making sure they are safe and well cared for during this whole process they are with us. Yes, so that is kind of, again, uh, you know, dependent on what type of patient uh, we are treating and what type of transplants we have done. But in general terms, the recovery process takes few weeks uh, for patients to recover once they're admitted, three to four weeks on average can be longer uh, and they have to stay in the hospital with us throughout that time, mainly for the concerns that because we have wiped off their immune system and their bone marrow, which means they don't have any resistance to infections. So they have to stay in the hospital and be looked after round the clock to look for any signs of infections and treat as it happens. And that allows us to be on top of that infection very quickly. But that process can be different to different individuals depending on their fitness levels, for example, and how they cope through those chemotherapies and what side effects they have. So everybody behaves a bit differently and we individually manage these complications as they happen during that process. Majority of patients go home by the end of third or fourth week, uh, but sometimes they can develop later com complications even after they're home and may have to be admitted back into the hospital 
to be cared for again if they do develop, for example, some fevers and their um, infection markers are high or they have certain complications affecting the organs, which may need a quick fix. And they may have to come back in the hospital and manage to gain. But that process slowly improves over time as the immune system builds up and the recovery happens uh, in a period of time. That recovery overall from starting from the transplant in terms of feeling much better, healthier, can take an average six to nine months in patients who receive allogenic stem cell transplants, meaning patient cells from somebody else, uh, and generally a bit shorter in patients who are having autologous stem cell transplants. Some patients do find them um, having difficulties in fatigue, post-transplant, which can last quite a few months. Uh, it's not something that is easily fixable. And we do recommend that while the patients are recovering at home, eating and drinking and then having a good rest, but at the same time should engage in more exercises, engage in more activities that will allow them to restructure their routine uh, and go back into normal routine in due course. And that allows the fatigue to improve and also allows them to feel physically and mentally better with uh, you know, daily sort of routine exercises. But that is why we have a strong engagement with the patient. We make sure that we explain everything and they understand what they are expected to do when they go home and how we have a close collaboration in terms of making sure the recovery process is smooth. Uh, and this is what the ultimate game is, uh, you know, from a sense of transplant recovery. I think very much why we do this transplants is what we expect to see. We want to make sure the patient has it done safely and they are effective for them, for the disease they are trying to get on you know, top of. And we hope they are cured for life. And that's the long-term outcome. But there are initial sort of issues around complications and problems that they have to expect uh, during this process. And, and sometimes it can be quite daunting uh, in terms of this variety of severity of complications they may see. So, so there is a, a realistic expectation in terms of how successful these procedures could be. We generally say about 50% of our patients will potentially be cured for the underlying disease if you were to do stem cell transplants in the correct, safe way. Um, but again, the other half of that group may not necessarily have a cure, but may also suffer from other complications that may complicate their recovery process. So it's, it's, it's being realistic about what is achievable from the disease, how long can we keep the disease at control, and what side effects and complications that are relevant to that procedure is well explained in advance. And, and unfortunately, there is a chance that patients can even face risk of uh, potential life-threatening complications, including death from having a transplant, but that is a relatively smaller risk compared to the bigger benefits of being cured from that disease long term. Uh, hence, we kind of talk about that in detail when they come in for their transplant to make sure they understand individually what their uh, expectations should be from that procedure and how long that will take for them to achieve that. Uh, and it's, it's a, you know, a teamwork, as you said, you know, we do it together and try and explain as things change over time. bone marrow donors uh, is, is clearly a very important part of this exercise. We are heavily dependent on goodwill of uh, unrelated uh, donors in the community internationally who are signing up to donate their stem cells when called upon. And that's a very humane thing to do. And I think we welcome more and more people registering and joining these registries, which are available and open for registration, free of cost, that you can sign up your name with. You just have to provide uh, a small tissue sample, which will be a buccal swab on your uh, mouth, or sometimes a blood sample that can we can check and keep information on the type of uh, DNA that you have that is then matched against that relevant patient who needs your help. So we look for those donors on those registries where they are registered before to see if they are matching to our patients in the correct way. The matching exercise is quite detailed, very comprehensive, and we also then make sure the patient and the donor are safe to go ahead with that transplant. Donor safety is priority. We make sure that they understand what they are signing up for. We explain the process of bone marrow stem cell donation, which is quite easy nowadays in terms of coming in in the morning, having stem cells collected from them using a machine that we have, and then they donate the same afternoon. And then that allows the patients to then have the stem cells they need and recover. There are no long-term side effects for these donors. And, and again, it's, it's all voluntary in process currently in the UK. So you can still, you know, can come back and say, I don't want to do it if you don't feel comfortable about doing the donation. But that's how the process is, that we have a good engagement with donors are 
partner registry Antinolan, for example, as well as DKMS in the UK have an active role in making sure the donors are registered, are looked after even after the donation and information is given as much as possible to the wider community to come forward and donate for these sick patients. Uh, and we need more of these, uh, you know, very highly motivated donors to come forward and do it for us. Uh, and that's the process we, we use for finding unrelated donors. Of course, there are related donors within the family. Even we have uh, potential use of donors which are half matched within the family, like your brothers who may not be full matched, but are half matched to you, your children, or even your parents that can potentially be used as donors provided they're medically fit to come forward and donate. So often that has allowed us to use more donors for our patients who need stem cells. In the past, we were very restricted to number of donors who are registered on this registry, but thankfully with increasing uh, or, or better development of transplant size, we are now able to do half match transplant successfully and perhaps with even better outcomes in some of these patients. So there is a lot of opportunities for us to do these transplants safely, successfully, and provide the best outcome for these patients.